ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here to draw another buggy with you. Um, we have a jeweled flower mantis under the microscope right now. Um, the microscope is as zoomed out as it will possibly go, so um, where this mantis isn't a huge mantis in the world of mantids, it is still too big to show in its entirety underneath my microscope. This is one of those specimens that I have not yet put a pin through. Um, I have not yet pinned. Um, it came spread like this um, um, in my um, in my uh, buggies from my friend. Um, so this is what it looks like on the board. I've taken the plastic off the top so that there isn't that reflection, but I left a little piece of plastic on the abdomen to hold the specimen in place so that it doesn't get injured um, as we are looking at it. Um, and it's one of those things where I'm in the process of putting pins through these um, specimens and organizing them in a really awesome way. But right now, this guy doesn't have a pin, but I still wanted to draw him. So, that him. Um, let me check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Her. Um, female mantid. Yeah, the females have more abdominal segments, and the males have less abdominal segments. Um, welcome, Susan! I see that you're here. Um, I might have a little bit less energy today than um, previous weeks, just because I've been sick for four days. But um, I really didn't want to miss two weeks in a, in a row of live streaming, so we're going to do the best that we can, and we're going to hang out and have fun and draw this beautiful mantis. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put up here, jeweled flower mantis. Now, um, this specimen, oops, uh, yeah, you can see the name up there. Um, this specimen, I can measure it right now, is... About 3.3 centimeters from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm personally curious what the inches on that is, so yeah, it's about an inch and a half long. Okay, so the scientific name on this mantis is Creobroder gematis. Um, we've got it right there. Susan, that you are sick with COVID too. It's it's not fun. I spent the first two days just laying in bed. I didn't do much. Yesterday I started to gain a little bit of energy back and today I've been being pretty normal. Um, I just took an hour and a half rest before the live stream so that I had the energy to be here for you guys. Because I don't want to miss two days in a row. That's sad. Um, so uh, because we don't really have the uh, ability to see the mantis as a whole underneath the microscope, I am going to pull it over here and just kind of put it off to the side. And I'm going to sketch my mantis here and hope, and I hope to just kind of um, leave that where we can see it. But this might be helpful to you. There. So this is the specimen in its entirety, all right? So if you're going to be sticking around and drawing this with us, um, uh, if you're going to be sticking around and drawing this with us, you can go ahead and um, take a picture with this on your phone. You can screenshot it, copy and paste it into a Paint or a Word document, just so that you have the specimen's entire image as we are, wa as we are working. This is a nice big picture for you. All right. Well, my Latin is filling me on this name. You know what? I didn't look up the Latin on this one either. I do believe gematis means gem or jewel. So that would probably be where jeweled comes from. But creo and broder, I'm not 
not exactly sure. Um, so if anybody wants to look it up, um, I would be interested in um, what that means also. All right. So um, this mantis, this flower mantis, has um, very kind of elongated and pointed compound eyes. You can kind of see that in the microscope here. Um, welcome, Deb. Good. We're glad that you're here. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and start with the head here with those nice tall eyes. So I'm going to give one eye that's nice and tall. Keep in mind I always do a nice light sketch first and then um, I will zoom in and we'll darken the, darken the sketches as we go. Right, so we've got that nice tall one right here and then a little mountain in the middle and then a kind of a tall compound eye on the other side. So now we've got both of them here. And what I'm gonna do to finish off this, um, this head is I am going to kind of just turn it into a cat head by making it come down. And I'm gonna bring it all the way down to a point. Um, the head from the front will come down all the way to a point, but from the back, the way we are seeing it, there is, this is the pronotum here that's along its back. So after we've got kind of that rough light outline of the head, I'm going to come to about the bottom third and I'm going to put an arch right here and that's where the, um, that's where the pronotum is going to kind of be blocking the back of that head. Um, the pronotum is a really cool shape on the, um, on this mantis. So instead of just going kind of straight, they're, um, uh, knobbed almost at the end of it here. It's kind of like, um, maybe it looks like a vase. It has a very vase-like shape. So, thumbs down, rounds out a little bit in the middle. This doesn't have to be purchased perfect because we are going to zoom in, keep in mind, but... The closer your, your light sketch is, the less you have to erase. All right, so we've got it kind of wide in the middle, coming back down to being fairly narrow. Um, for our, uh, for the four legs, or the pro legs up here in the front, um, they are fairly long. In fact, if I was just going to measure the length of... We're going to say that coxa and the femur here. So the coxa and the femur are two centimeters by themselves. That's up to this joint here. Um, so this section is fairly long. It's going to be coming out from the pronotum and going up. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give myself an estimate on the length of these um, legs and kind of give myself a stick leg version. Um, kind of like that is where I'm going to be going with my front legs. Um, and then I'll be able to fill that in when we zoom in and add detail. All right, so we've got the head, we have the pronotum, um, we have two more segments of the thorax. So after this line here, I'm just going to kind of add another rectangular box that's going to be the remainder of the thorax. It might be just a little bit longer than that. Yeah, more like that. Um, so now that's our thorax. And then we have an abdomen. Now the abdomen um, does get nice and wide before it goes narrow again. So from here, we're going to take that and we're going to round it out, kind of like in a big parenthesis shape on both sides. Try and keep it as even as possible. Insects are symmetrical. And then we're going to end way down here. Um, I'm going to aim for a point at the end of the abdomen, but there are going to be additional appendages down there we will add when we zoom in and check them out. Um, for instance, praying mantids um, taxonomically are an orthopteroid meaning that back in the day, a long, long time ago, they actually used to be in the same order as grasshoppers. Um, so they have Circe. Okay. We also have our four wings. Um, those wings um, only connect to the body after the pronotum. So 
Even though the front pair of wings is connected to the first segment of the thorax, um, even though the front wings are connected to the first segment of the thorax, uh, they are connected at the very, very end. So right about here where this ends, we've got those nice long wings coming out. And if I was going to measure, let's get some, we're going to get a wing length with the ruler that I seem to have misplaced. same place. But my, um, my ruler is gone. That's okay. So, let's see. I'm gonna say this wing here, the front wing, is about the length of the abdomen. And when I find the ruler, because I'm sure I will by the end of the live stream, I'll make sure to give you an actual number, member, um, number. But if I take kind of the length of where our abdomen was and then we put it out this way, that's what I'm thinking. Our wing is just going to go all the way to the edge of the paper. I think I've got the spacing on this specimen just about right. Um, so there is a little bit of a point at the end of the forewing and then it comes back down. Now, because praying mantids are an orthopteroid, I'm going to go ahead and spell that for you. Um, orthopteroid is, if you're familiar with your taxonomy, it's a super family. Um, so it's um, a group above family. So it includes multiple families of insects. Nope, it's not a super family. It's a super order. It includes multiple orders. Um, orthoptera. Um, which are your grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Uh, Dermaptera, which are your earwigs. Blatodia, which are your roaches. Um, the mantids, mantodia. Walking sticks, phasmatodia. All of those are orthopteroids. They have similar characteristics in that they have cerci on the end of their abdomen, and their front pair of wings are what we call leathery front wings. Um, these kind of these thicker leathery front wings are not as hard as the elytra of a beetle, but they are um, thick enough to protect the membranous wings. Um, you'll notice, like the front wings of a grasshopper, they don't flap a lot when they're flying, they're mostly protective. And this type of leathery front wing, we call it a tegmina. So that's what that's what mantids have. They have tegmina um, on their front wings. And then their hind wings are what we consider membranous. Now the hind wings are nice and wide and arched and so I'm gonna they um, they do separate from the front wing. They do come to their own point but they are this nice, wide, circular hind wing, mostly like that. Looks like Orthoptera, straight wing, yes. Um, Orthoptera is, <coughs> I could go, Orthoptera is, um, the order for grasshoppers and crickets and katydids, and um, in insects, um, the first insect to be identified in a group um, gets named for the genus, and then that name travels up um, to the tribe, the subfamily, the superfamily, and so on, and then those names only get trumped if um, there's a specimen that was identified earlier. So the grasshoppers were the first order to be identified in the super order Orthopteroids, which is why they got to keep the name Orthoptera and everybody else got to change. Are cockroaches closely related? Yes, cockroaches are in that group too. 
Blattodia. All right, now you can't see much of the middle leg here, but I do want to draw our guy just like how we are seeing it. So the middle leg is going to be coming out from right around here on the on the hind leg. So it would be coming up and then back down. And then those hind legs here are going to be coming... something like this. All right, and now we have a rough outline of our praying mantis. I'm so happy about that. Um, so we'll go ahead. I think, it, is it weird that I think cockroaches are quite beautiful? No, it's not weird. I also believe that there are a good number of, um, cockroaches that are absolutely gorgeous. I would say not all of them. Like, I'm not a fan of the American roach. Um, it's a cockroach. It's kind of icky. It has a whole bunch of names. It's also called the palmetto bug. Um, and sometimes people call it a water bug. Um, even though they're not. Um, that always made me laugh. Oh, and termites, because termites are officially cockroaches. Uh, genetically, they took the genetics of termites and they, um, they divided it out and discovered that termites genetically fall right in the middle of the order of cockroaches. So they're just essentially adapted communal cockroaches. Nowhere closely related to ants. Oh, so the first uh, first really long segment is the coxa here. Yes! Um, the, the raptorial front legs of praying mantids are uniquely adapted and that the coxa is the first elongated segment, which also means that the trochanter um, is super big and obvious. When we're drawing that front leg, it'll be cool because I'll be able to point out some special parts. There was a, um, I used to have a colony of uh, giant cave cockroaches, Blabberus giganteus, and they had a six inch wingspan, and they were my favorite. Um, but I also love, like, domino roaches. There's um, a species of roach called the Simondoan cave cockroach, and it's extinct in the wild, but it is kept alive in universities and insectariums, um, and that is an absolutely gorgeous roach. Um, it was only found in certain caves in Simondoa, and then um, they mined those caves, and we haven't seen them since. Alright, so now what I'm doing is I'm trying to see about the actual size of this compound eye, because now that we are zoomed in and checking out the head of this mantis here, I'm noticing that not this whole piece is actually a compound eye. Um, the compound eye is up here at the very point, but if you see there's this vertical line right here, that is actually the compound eye here, and then over here, this. So the compound eye is on the, the tip of these two pieces, but is not the whole piece, like I originally thought when we were looking at it from far away. So we're going to go from the top of this point, we're going to go about halfway down, and we're going to give ourselves a little diagonal line on both sides. And that is going to be our compound eye. Just try and make sure that they stay symmetrical. Let's see. On that angle. All right. And um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of darken this point here. Um, I am going to go just a tiny bit outside of where I originally planned because I want these eyes to be just a little bulbous around where I where I expected them to be. Just a little bit wider. 
I like it. Okay, so we got some. Mm, we might need to make these bigger. No, that's fine. Okay, so we've got these compound eyes here coming on down, and then the head here. Um, the, the front of the head does not just go straight across. There's this little bit of a mountain here in the center, so we're going to give it that cute little mountain guy, and then just um, continue the head down. Like snow on the beach. Okay, so we've got some of this head started. The antenna are going to be filiform or long and straight antenna. They're going to be connected here and here. Mantids are one of those things, just like grasshoppers and crickets and katydids. We don't count the segments of the antenna. There are too many. All right. What we do is we compare the length of the antenna to the length of a body part or the length of the body. Okay. Um, so there is also, this kind of neck-like region that connects to the back of the head here. Um, so we have the connection where we know the pronotum is going to be connected, but there is one additional kind of neck, um, integument here that's going to be connecting to the head. So I'll make sure I get that guy in. Um, we'll do, we'll add the antenna once we add the legs so that we know how long they're going to be. If you view a mantis from the side, the second long leg seg, the second long leg segment comes up from the first, so that's how you can tell the second is the femur. Yes! Yeah! So if you are looking at a, um, sorry, that took me a minute, but if a praying mantis is sitting at rest, the coxa, the hip bone, is actually coming down. All right, so that's that hip bone. The trochanter is like little pizza shape. It's this. It's going to be right here on the corner. It creates that corner. It creates the elbow. Then this is the femur with all the spikes on the inside. The tibia spikes this way and then the tarsal segments come off of that and so many people when they're looking at a praying mantis leg they see this portion and they forget the tarsal segments at the end but that's gonna be like looking at it from a side coxa trochanter femur, femur tibia tarsi all right So now that I'm all zoomed in and looking at this praying mantis, um, a little, there's a, um, does anybody else see a face? Um, I feel like now that we're zoomed into the pronotum, it no longer looks like a vase, but it looks a little bit like an Easter Island stone with the eye here and here and the nose. Kind of wild. All right, so um, here I'm going to make sure that that is, has a nice arch going up to the head and comes almost straight down. It, cut, it does widen just a little bit during the beginning of the pronotum here. So we're going to make sure that these, they don't come down perfectly straight, but it's pretty gosh darn close. I'm going to erase any of these sketch lines I don't need. And then right here at the end, it's really sharp on the, the, this angle is sharp on the top and then kind of round on the bottom. So I'm going to kind of sharply go out on the top, but then round off that curve and come on back in. Um, and come all the way to the bottom where it come, becomes the narrow. And then instead... And then instead of going straight across here, we're going to give it a U. So we're going to go down, and then we're going to give it a whoop. Here we are. 
And that is the Pro Notum. Um, and it almost looks like an angry face if you add these lines here. Because <laughs> you've got that dark, um, it's dark here. And then it almost looks like it has white angry eyebrows. And then a nose. And then, um, almost like a, like an angry face. Yeah. This is what I see. I think that that's pretty realistic, too. <laughs> Outside of maybe there's actually an additional little... Oh, that's even worse. Look at that. Yep. So uh, so that's what the uh, pronotum looks like. <laughs> I love it. Good job, guys. All right. So um, we're going to continue on the body. We'll do the entire body, and then we'll do legs, wings. Alright, so what we are looking at here are sclerotized pieces of the second and third segments of the thorax. Let me go ahead and walk you through this one because it almost looks a little trickier in this region. Um, but what I want you to focus on are what we would call the sclerites. Um, the sclerites are the the pieces of the suit of armor, right? So the sclerites are the individual exoskeleton segments that all come together to make the buggy. So if we look at the sclerite on the top of the second segment of the thorax, we might call it the mesonotum, all right? Because um, that would be the notum, meaning on the top of the buggy, and meso, meaning the second segment of the thorax, um, is right here. It's this, it's this one, that plate. Um, and if we look right about here, it kind of comes out wide and then comes down to like this little U shape. You still have integument or like that soft stuff around um, around the sclerite to connect it. So you can still make the make it kind of wider, but that's gonna be the actual solid segment. And actually, instead of making it arch down, I think that it comes down to a point and then arches up like this because it has to connect to the metanotum. So the metanotum would be the third segment of the thorax on the top, and um, that would be this little sclerite guy here. So it arches up and then comes down mostly straight and comes down to like this little point. So we've got these kind of more narrow segments, but there is some, um, I'm going to connect the integument or the body up to the mesonotum here. So right about here is where I'm going to connect these lines, and then I'm going to erase all of these sketchy lines because what I don't have here yet are the wings, and the wings are going to fill in some of those regions that I haven't filled out yet. Um, so, as a, as a general insect rule, pro means first, meso, meso means second, meta means third. Um, so you can use those, um, those beginnings of the words um, to modify a lot of things. Like, if um, on this front leg, I could say the pro coxa is expanded because that would be the coxa, but I want to say it's specifically the first one, not the second or the third. So you can say that, you can say metafemur or mesotibia. Um, and when you know kind of how to put the words together, then you'll understand scientists when scientists just start putting words together like that. Um, it's kind of fascinating. 
I was talking to a friend recently about the um, entomological dictionary because there are so many words. There are what, like, I don't know. There's a huge number of words in the um, English dictionary, right? But not all of the bug words can be found in the dictionary. They just can't. If you're trying to key or trying to read a scientific article and you're using a normal dictionary, there's a good chance that you're going to run into words that you just can't find the definition to. Um, there is a completely separate entomological dictionary that has 35,000 words. Um, not all of them, some of those words are scientific names and things like that, but 35,000 words just for the entomological dictionary. I love it. One of these days I will own the entomology dictionary. That is something I don't own yet. Um, I just tend to look things up online. Okay, so um, we're about to be moving into this abdomen, and um, the abdomen is long enough that it's not fitting on my under the microscope in its entirety. So I'm going to go ahead and count the segments back from the thorax. Um, I believe I counted eight earlier, but I'm going to recount just to make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh-oh. What's this? Yeah. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. 11. All right, it's definitely a female because it has all of these extra segments here at the very, very end of the abdomen. Um, so I originally thought it was eight because from afar, this all looked like one segment, but um, I'm seeing that it is actually three segments. There are 11 here, um, but the last three are equivalent to one. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and at the top. We already have a general outline of where we want these, um, of where we want the, the segments to land. So we've got this kind of outline, and I think that that is going to be pretty accurate for my specimen. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to subdivide. I'm actually going to subdivide this into eight, um, but the first... The first abdominal segment is after the metanotum. So I'm going to find the tip of this metanotum here. I'm going to cross it over, and that's the actual true end of the thorax. All right, and then you're moving into the abdomen. Okay. So I'm going to subdivide this into eight really quick, nice and lightly. Um, and it looks like eight equal segments. So one, two, three, four, five, smaller. That's why we do this nice and light. Let's see if I break it in half and then half again. And then half again up here and down there. And then that's one, two, three, four. So I need four more. One, two, three, four. All right, so that is me subdividing these into eight kind of sub-equal segments. And then at the um, edge of each of these segments, they're kind of bulbous. I'm going to show you this. So, uh, female mantids tend to have kind of um, squishier abdomens. Their, their exoskeleton on their abdomen isn't really hard like a beetle. You can almost like squish it a little bit. And that makes them kind of bloat a lot. 
so they can eat a whole lot of food and their and their segments get really fat and then as they um, digest that food their segments visibly get thinner um, so what we're seeing here is a big fat female and so you can see that those segments are bloated those segments can go all the way straight if she was hungry um, but the other thing that I am noticing is that along the top of our abdomen for at least the first, let's see, for at least the first one, two, three, four segments, the wings are covering the edges. The hind wings cover the edges. So um, I'm going to do that nice and lightly here. I'm going to imagine that this hind wing is coming off of the mesonotum, um, coming down, covering the edges fully on the first three segments, and then coming off sideways on the fourth one. Actually, that matched perfect. Um, and we'll do that same thing on the other side, nice and light. We're going to come down. We're going to block one two, three segments and come out on that fourth segment here. So now we know where these, where the lines are going to go. So we can darken any of these abdominal segments. I'm okay with kind of darkening these now. And then once we get to that fourth segment, this is where we can start adding the edges of our body. So one that comes out points and then comes over and then back. Okay, so from this point on, we can um, we can create these segments. I'm just gonna make the edges of her body kind of parentheses shape to show how big and fat she is, and then and then bring it over, and we're gonna go again and again. Uh, right now, keep in mind, I mentioned that that last segment, even though it's kind of sub-equal to all the other ones, in this specimen, it's not actually one segment, it's three. I'm going to rewrite this name really quick so that people who join us late can see what we're learning about in common. So these are the final three segments, one, one, two, three, that we can see. Um, in fact, the this is one, two, three. The fourth to last segment, instead of connecting here, it does look like it's a little bit separate. So I'm actually going to give the fourth segment little tails, essentially. Yeah. All right, now we have three segments after this, and they're really, really, really tight. Um, one, two, three. So one of them is going to be like this. It matches the fourth one where it's kind of pointed on the edges here. And then the next two segments are rounded out. So there's one. Round it out, and then a little circle one. So you've got like three little itty bitty segments here, um, and today is not gonna be my best drawing ever. But I think that we're getting this thing across. Love it. All right. So way down here at the very end of our abdomen, we do get to Circe. Now, that is this little finger-like appendage right here. It's connected to the final abdominal segment. So if you come right about here, the last segment gets one little finger-like appendage, two little finger-like appendages. All right, those are the little Circe. 
spelled C-E-R-C-I. Um, or individually, they, it is a Circus, spelled C-E-R-C-U-S. What is my hair doing? Okay. Alrighty. Um, we have a head, a thorax, an abdomen. We've got all that figured out. Let's do a leg. So we're going to start with our pro leg. I wonder how much of this leg I can get under the microscope at one time. See, I can personally see the entire leg under my microscope, but the uh, camera just doesn't have as wide of a view as the human eye does. So we'll take it back. Praying mantids, front legs are adapted for grabbing onto things. You know that. Um, and insects with adapted legs, those legs that are like unique or have a special purpose or a special like function that they do, they will um, get their own special name. So if you have a grabbing leg, um, grabbing legs are raptorial. So, um, an entomologist might say praying mantids have raptorial prolegs. They also just might say raptorial forelegs. Um, because four mid and hind are also kind of used in junction, used also. Uh, I wish there was a rule for it, but there is not. They just kind of use them interchangeably. zoom in just a little bit. Alright, from this view I can see the coxa, the procoxa, and the protrochanter. Alright, so the coxa is coming out from our pronotum right about here. Um, it's nice and wide at the base. Very, very strong mantis. So we're going to start the front of it it goes a little bit longer than the com than the eye, so we're going to start it up there, bring it all the way back to the top of our um, to the top of the pronotum. I'm making it just a little bit wider so it's not sitting exactly on the head. <coughs> That's just an artistic choice. Um, the inside edge of the coxa has a little hook at the end, and it's kind of pointed on the far side and then comes around. Um, the bottom is convex and meets the pronotum where it's starting to get wider, right? So that, print, that front leg is fairly wide. It starts way up here and it doesn't stop until we're right about where the pronotum is. <clears throat> now, um, the trochanter, let me spell that out because we don't see the word trochanter very regularly. Um, the trochanter is this little triangular shape. It's not as much pizza at this angle, but it's here. This little segment right here that's wide at the bottom, pointed at the top, that's going to be the segment that helps the femur really bend, right? It helps it do this. It's this part here, the trochanter. So... Kind of wide at the base, like snow on the beach. Ugh. All right. So we've got a trochanter here. Uh, right now, the femur is the next segment, and I'm making it a little bit wider. So let's go ahead and move our specimen just a little bit. Just a skosh. I wonder how much we can see. There we are. All right, so two things to note about the, um, about the femur. Let me see if, if I darken it, you can see a little, the spines a little bit better. They don't get 
clear it out. Okay. Um, two things to note about the femur. It is not the widest at the base. It's widest um, about, I don't know, halfway, a little less than halfway up the leg there. And the spines do not go straight out. The spines are angled up slightly. And that's because here, if we're looking at the praying mantis from, um, from the side, those spines are always going to be going up towards the joint, um, towards the joint so that the specimen can't slip out. All right, kind of like shark's teeth. Shark have teeth that are angled in so that fish have a harder time swimming out. Praying mantids, raptorial front legs have spines that are going to kind of help keep them in there. All right. This is a fairly good sized femur. Wow. My ruler has not shown up yet. That's okay. All right, so I believe the femur is approximately the same size as our coxa there, um, and that would make sense. The femur might be, eh, and they look fairly sub-equal. If either one is larger, I would say that the femur is slightly larger than the coxa, but if you see kind of an image like this, the coxa and the femur, they do kind of want to be the same length so that you have that um, easy kind of range of motion. So we're going to make sure that our femur is fairly equal. Um, up here at the top, it's just simple on the inside, so that's where I'm going to start. It's more straight-ish. Um, so we're going to come up. like that. And then once we get up to the top, I'm going to notice that I'm not going to have enough room for the rest of the leg, so I'm going to be bending it a little bit later. That's fine. Um, at the end, instead of going straight across, I'm going to angle it down into the left just a little bit to give you that. Um, and now we've got these spines happening here. Um, let's say this is the widest part. Oh, I have a new, I have another bug word that I haven't used in the live stream before. Um, I was reading an article, actually it was an Eric Eaton article. Um, Eric Eaton is writing his blogs again, so if you don't read Eric Eaton's blogs, I would suggest you go and do that because they're fun. Um, you know what? I think that this is a little big. Maybe that's why. Um, and I think that I can use this word because the femur here, do you see how it has this kind of striping, but not, it's not a striping of the, um, it's not striping like a, a textural stripe, right? It's a stripe in colors, green, yellow, green, yellow, green, yellow. We call color stripes annulated. Yeah. So you could say that the profemur is annulated, green and yellow. I'm going to make sure I spelled that right. Yeah. Um, a lot of times they um, annulated also means kind of ringed, but um, when it's a ring of color around the legs, then it looks like a striping, right? All right, now you've got some spines here. Let's see. The biggest one at the base coming up. And praying mantids do tend to have kind of alternating really large and then small um, spines. And I'm not sure if there is a um, if there is a reason or a purpose for this, but it is something that I have seen regularly now on mantids, where the spines are not all the same. They're not all long. They they like alternate long to short. I'm gonna have to look closer at the mantids when they're alive and see if the long ones on one side equate to a short one on the other side. All right, 
right, now we have the tibia and the tarsal segments. Annulus is a sort of ring shape. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I beat you to it, but that's all right. I love that we're on the same, like, train of thought. Um, now, when we look really closely at the uh, tibia of a praying mantis... I want to show you something, but I don't know how. Maybe I'll draw it over here. Um, if I was to once again rotate this front leg, and I was looking at it so that um, I was looking at it from this angle, like from the front, the tibia is going to come out, but it has... The tibia of praying mantids ends in two spines next to one another. All right, these spines, when this um, when this tibia closes onto the femur, those um, those spines wrap around the left and the right side of the femur. All right, so if you kind of boop, we've got like the femur. I don't know. Yeah, they, they, they kind of wrap like this, all right? And then the, uh, the tarsal segments, they don't come out from either of these tips. The tarsal segment actually comes out from the base of that V here. They come out right around here. And so that's why sometimes it almost, from, from the side, the tarsal segments look like they're coming out not from the end of the tibia, but from like somewhere in the middle. It's because they are coming out from this uh, V here. It looks like there are two rows and the shorter ones might look longer if flipped over. You know what, um, Matthew, you might be, you might be right. So if we look up here, it looks like the big ones are the ones that are closer. And then if we zoom down to look at the spines that are a little bit further away, they are kind of hidden down there. Um, I would say there's definitely a variety in size, but I think you're right. The, um, the small ones that we were primarily seeing are the ones on the other side. And on the tibia, you also have a double row of spines on the inside of the tibia. They're just a little bit trickier to see because um, uh, because the tibia is a little thinner. And math and annulus is the region between two concentric circles. <laughs> cool. Here we go. So up here from our femur, our tibia is actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold my tibia down so that I have room on my paper. The tibia is approximately uh, half of the length of the femur, so it's only going to be about this big anyway. Um, so the tibia should be able to reach not to the entire femur, but up to this point here. The wide point of the femur is where the tibia is going to, in theory, end when the praying mantis has its legs closed. So we're gonna, I'm just gonna bring it down like this for me.
Okay. All right, so I've got my tibia coming down. And then just make sure that those, um, that those spines are all going in the right direction. This tibia just made a liar out of me because they're going in the opposite direction. These spines are going this way. To fit in with the front legs. This is a unique species. I haven't drawn a tropical mantis before, guys. So, um, the, the femur spines are going up and the tibial spines are pointing down so that they can kind of, um, connect with one another. That's cool, too! All right. So I'm going to give that, um, one spine, the larger spine at the bottom, and then on the inside of my tibia, I will admit, I'm not going to count those spines. I'm just going to give them, to give it a number of spines coming all the way up to the base, just making sure that those spines get smaller and smaller as I get closer to the top, wider when I get to the bottom. That's where I'm going to leave it. Okay, and then the tarsal segments... Keep in mind, because they're coming out from the top, they're actually going to be coming out from right around here. Hi, Pi! Welcome! One. Two. One, two, three, four, five, six. I am seeing six tarsal segments here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so from the end of our, from the end of our tibia here, we have six tarsal segments. Um, yeah. And welcome, Matthew. Of course, I think that might be the first time I've heard from you. I'm, we are happy that, to have you. Um, so, we have our six tarsal segments here. <laughs> it should have tarsal claws, too. <laughs> yeah, because what are the tarsal claws for, really? I feel like the entire, the, the entire pro tar, like all of the tarsi on the first leg, um... <laughs> Like, this is enough, Mr. Mantis, or Mrs. Mantis. One, two, more rectangular segments. Um, three, four, and five are more, I would, they're not super triangular, but they do kind of end wide and then start narrow again. So they have that same kind of ending. They're just more boxy. So we're going to go... Three, four, five, and that sixth segment is raindrops. Narrow at the base, round at the end, and just like um, Susan mentioned, they also get little tarsal claws. <laughs> Super duper cute. Awesome. <sighs> All right, so that is our front leg. We did it, guys. I'm proud of us. All right, now we're going to go on to the tagmina. Oh, yay. Good. I'm glad you were able to make it this time. see. Darken it just a little bit so we can see the end a little better. Now, the Tegmina, they are generally colored um, green or brown most of the time. Sometimes Tegmina can be really, really beautiful and colorful though. There are some praying mantids with structural colors like beetles. Not very many of them. Most praying mantids are pigmented, meaning that the specimens do fade over time. Um, but there is a mantis, there are some jewel mantids, and 
And if you've never seen a picture of a jewel mantis, go and look it up. They're absolutely gorgeous, and I love them. Um, it's like a jewel bark. I think it's a species of bark mantis. That's the, the jewel mantis. And it's small, like a flower mantis, but they're metallic. They're blue, and they're purple, and... Um, uh, sometimes people have them in the pet trade, even though you're not allowed to have mantids. Um, so, you know. Alrighty. Let's see. We're drawing that front wing. Here we are. Um, so I'm actually pretty happy with the overall shape of my wing. Other than the end of my wing, I don't want it to be as pointed. I'm going to kind of round, like, round that edge off a little bit. And maybe make it more narrow on the top, heavier, a little heavier on the bottom, and connect it wider. All right, so I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to go ahead and darken the outside the line on here. And then all now, now all I have to do is erase some of my sketch lines, and I didn't like how sharp that was. So I'm going to flatten that out just a little bit. All right. The jeweled flower mantis has eye spots, ladies and gentlemen. These eye spots um, on the front wings are used um, as a defense. Um, there is also one vein that I want to point out to you, and I'm going to move the microscope just a skosh, just a little bit because I want to show you where this vein connects and why it's important. Um, so, this vein is the one I'm talking about. It connects right here, and this is where the wing is going to connect to the base of the pronotum. All right, that's where it connects. Now, this vein, you can see it's really, really thick, and it comes out in this direction. Um, and then we're going to scoot this specimen over and follow that vein. It goes out to right up above the eye and then should end yeah it ends up here all right the wing region above that vein is not on the back of the praying mantis all right that's the area of the wing that folds around the edge of the praying mantis while it is seated while it's while the wings are shut so that this vein here is kind of where the wing bends a little bit. Um, you're not going to see that because this specimen has been flattened nicely, um, like molted, spread really nicely, and those wings have been flattened out. Um, but naturally, this would be kind of like an edge um, where this is going to be the, the, down here is the top of the mantis, and down here is the lateral or the side. So I'm going to make sure that I have at least that vein on my, um, on my sketch first before I put the colors in because I know that that eye doesn't go to the side of the body, it just goes on the top. So um, right here from the bottom of our pronotum, I'm going to take this up, give me a, a small region on the top, and then kind of dis goes into goes into the edge and so when that wing closes that part folds to the lateral and now all I have to do is get some white spots get some eye spots on here so that first little white the that first little white spot is right here at the very base I'm just going to go ahead and give us an estimate um, and then right here on the edge we've got nice dark borders on the left and the right of that eye spot and a little spot on the inside and um, I am going to go ahead and put a little bit of graphite around those to show that those are actually the white spots not dark spots um, so maybe I'll just smudge it all in and then erase inside of them Yeah, like that. Very good. So now we're going to do the hind wing. Now the hind wing is not a tegmina. It is a membranous hind wing.
Very good. So this hind wing, it is tucked underneath the front wing. It connects right here to the mesonotum, comes out, separates from the front wing, comes on back. Really, really nice and wide, um, even over top of this. I'm actually pretty happy with my first, um, with my first uh, sketch on the outline. So I'm just gonna follow what I originally had, and then what we added when we did the. Um, when we did the abdomen and erase any of these sketch lines on the inside that I no longer need. Now, um, praying mantis hind wings are really cool because the veins essentially all radiate from a single point. I've always thought that that was really cool. Instead of having like um, unique different cross sections and cells and stuff, the veins look more like this. If you start from the top, you can Just kind of radiate these, um, you can radiate veins out from this center point. Now you also have those cute little, um, those white, those white designs. There is some color in here. This region right here on the wing from here in this space, that is actually a true pink color. I know that in the microscope it looks orangish. It's a mixture between the lighting on the microscope and the fading colors. That is pink. I promise. And um, we can't actually see the edge of the wing underneath the microscope right now. So if I scooched it over, there is, the tip of this wing is green way over here. Or used to be green. Should be green. Was green. Is no longer green. And I might... going to narrow my wing just a little bit here because I do want that point to be a little bit more just a little bit more I'm happier with that okay so I'm gonna kind of cart out this green area and then we've got this dark area and I know I have really pretty veins all situated here but I'm going to smudge it in a little bit. Okay, so that's our hind wing. So we've got a front wing, we have a hind wing. Um, now our job will be the middle and the hind legs. So this middle leg, <laughs> we saw it earlier, it looks like it's coming right out of the wing. I promise that it is not. Um, it's connected up here to the mesothorax, this middle segment of the thorax. It's not, I, it's not technically connected to the mesonotum because the mesonotum would be on the top. The legs are collected, connected to the sternum, the bottom. So you would almost say, you could say that the legs are connected that the middle leg is connected to the mesosternum. Just trying to up the language here every now and again. All right, so we have a nice thin tibia here. Comes out from that leg, from, comes up, down. That's where the tibia ends. 
And then we have these tarsal segments. There is one, two, three, four, five, possibly six. We're going to zoom in. One, two, three, four. want there to be, oh, I definitely want there to be six tarsal segments, but I am only counting five unless we decide that this little thing here is a tarsal segment. I don't know what it is. It looks like a growth. <gasps> I don't think that that's a true segment. All right, so if that's not a segment, then we are going to call it five. We're just gonna call it five. The first one is a nice long rectangular segment. <coughs> so we're going to, oh. This is the end of my tibia, so I'm going to give it some points on the edges so that it's distinct. So we've got the end of our tibia here. And then the first tarsal segment is a long rectangular segment. So that's one. And then we have one, two, three tarsal segments that are more triangular. One, two... Three tarsal segments that are more triangular, and we've got that one that's kind of a really long, almost, we're still going to call it raindrop shapes, but it's like more narrow, um, still round at the end, still has tarsal claws, it's just a little narrower, so that's how I'm going to draw that, la that, that, those middle tarsi. Let's do the hind leg. Mm -hmm. Oh, and because I gave you, um, oh, look it, the hind tibia is annulated. Using my word, my new word again. Okay. Um, <clears throat> also the femur is, the hind femur is kind of wide. Um, flower mantids are well known for having mimicry of flowers. So, for instance, the orchid mantis is a species of flower mantis. Um, this is a jeweled flower mantis. So, they regularly have, um, like, leaf shapes in their legs or mimicry kind of hidden throughout their body. Um, so, that's just another little fun little tidbit. All right. So, on this, I did, um, on my little sketch, I made the femur too long here, so the femur is going to be shorter. Coming out, um, and this one, I'm going to make sure it comes down at least one more segment, so it's going to be coming out, um, it's going to appear to be coming out of <laughs> this first segment right here um, that is full after the wing. And it has that nice leaf that kind of nice wide leaf shape. Um, and then there's that vein along the center. That vein almost looks like that central vein of a, uh, of a, of a, of a leaf. But that's um, going to be kind of where most of the power is of the mantis. The rest of this, it kind of gets really thin like a leaf. But this part here is thick like the leg part. All right. Now, after the fib femur, we get the tibia nice and long. In fact, um, about a third of it is actually past the length of the abdomen. So I'm going to say right here. 
worried about like that. It's gonna be our hind leg or our hind tibia that has those rings of color. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. This one is definitely five tarsal segments. So maybe the middle and the hind legs have five and the front legs have six. The front legs are unique and significantly different than the other two legs. So it's fair that they have a different number of tarsal segments. It just, um, sometimes I have to double and triple check myself uh, with counting. So that first tarsal segment is going to be a little bit less than half of the length of the tibia. It's actually pretty long. So we're going to say kind of like that, but it is nice and narrow. All right, so we've got that one. Now we have two, three, and four. Are those more triangular shapes where they get kind of wider at the end? Two, three, four. And then that fifth one, raindrop, narrow at the end, round at the base narrow at the base, round at the end, and then the two claws. Oh, he's so cute! I am so happy with this mantis, ladies and gentlemen. I wasn't sure about it when I started. And on the right side of my body, I'm actually going to draw in the abdomen here so that it doesn't look like I skipped the other side of the wings. Yeah. Beautiful. So do they hide on flowers like crab spiders waiting for prey? Uh, yes. I'm not sure what flowers they would, I'm not sure what flowers they, they do regularly sit on, but yes, um, this would be one of those species that kind of hangs out on flowers. Um, awesome. I knew there was one other word I wanted to give you. Because I gave you the name for the front leg being a raptorial front leg, I did want to give you the names for the middle and the hind legs too. So the middle and the hind legs, they're just basic legs, right? But we have names for everything. So they are what you would consider walking legs, just kind of basic walking legs. But uh, insect walking legs are considered ambulatory legs um, and that word is rooted in the word amble like meander or to kind of walk slowly ambulatory um, they can sometimes be confused with running legs because running legs and walking legs do look very similar they're they're um, and almost from when seeing them on a dead specimen, sometimes they can be trickier to tell apart if you're not sure what the speed is of that insect. But like when you see a tiger beetle and you see those really, really narrow, really, really long, like abnormally long legs, you know then that those are running legs. Um, whereas walking legs tend to be kind of average. Like, the average insect is going to have at least one pair of walking legs, even if um, even if it's like a mole cricket, and the front legs are digging legs, and the hind legs are jumping legs. It still has walking legs in the middle to keep its balance. Are you able to show us the entire mantis and your drawing? I can try my best. zoom out my camera just a little bit, I can hold it. So that is my entire drawing, and we can put him right here. Oh, that's so cute! Yep, so that's my sketch today. 
Um, I hope that your sketches turned out just the way that you wanted them to. I hope that you have had a fabulous time checking out this mantis super close up with me. I think that the abdomen got too fat right here. I'm going to be narrowing that down shortly. Um, but that's, uh, that's what we drew today. And I'm seeing that we've got a huge influx of viewers right now at this moment. So, welcome! We just drew this jeweled flower mantis. And if you're curious about facts about this mantis or you want to draw it with us, um, you can go ahead and rewind or rewatch this. It was really fun. Um, it was a really fun process. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead over here. All right. So um, I want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me today and for drawing this jeweled flower mantis. Um, if you have an idea of what you want, um, of what you want to see next week, or maybe just like an order, if you want to draw a beetle or a butterfly or a grasshopper, let me know over there in the comments, and um, I can see about um, taking a note and maybe drawing something out of that order. Um, no problem, Susan. I'm glad I was able to share this mantis with you. Um, so this is my little bit of an outro. Up there is your reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All of my friends here, um, Susan and Matthew and Pi and Deb, um, thank you so much for communicating with me during the live. It really keeps it moving. It helps me answer questions. I love that you guys are always interacting. Um, thank you, and please come back and continue to do it. For those of you who aren't, you need to subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can chat with all of the rest of us and have a great time. Okay, um, this link down here is a link to my PayPal. It just um, is quick donations. If you um, have really enjoyed class today or if you've really enjoyed hanging out, um, just a couple dollars means a lot. I'm actually going to be traveling with Insectopia a whole bunch this year. Um, in fact, in two weeks, I will be in Kansas City, Missouri, and then I'll be in Pittsburgh, and then I'll be in Tampa, and then I'll be in Richmond. So, next weekend I'm here, but then for four weekends, I'm going to be in different cities, um, and I'm going to be showing off live animals. Uh, so, if you are in any of those regions and you're curious, you can go ahead and email me and I'll tell you the details as to where I'm going to be. Um... This is a reminder for me to tell you that I teach classes for kiddos ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, 13 to 16, um, uh, insect studies classes. So instead of doing very highly detailed scientific illustrations, um, I taught four classes today, and those classes look a little bit like this. I taught a class on the Viceroy... Oh, on the Viceroy Butterfly, although it's backwards, um, <clears throat> today, and how the adult is a monarch mimic, but they're also um, bitter tasting themselves. So their monarchs and viceroys are actually co-mimics. They mimic each other. Um, but the caterpillar and the pupa of the Viceroy Butterfly are bird poop mimics, and if you've not seen it, you should go and look because it's awesome. Um... And maybe you can make it up to Albany toward the end of May for Carter Blues. Yes, Susan, please. I would absolutely love that. I'm so sorry that I missed um, that I missed last season, and I definitely want to put that on my calendar. So let me. I'm gonna put it on my calendar so that it happens. I'll email you. Okay. Um, other than that, if you've drawn with me today and you would like to, um, if you've drawn with me today and you would like me to share your image on my Facebook page, you can always email me, Trisha at theinsectopia.com and share your pictures with me. I love seeing art inspired by, um, individuals who have come to these live streams. Um, it's kind of part of why I do what I do. I like inspiring people to look closer at insects and to ask more questions and, to um, really kind of come to understand these creatures, I think that sometimes they're misunderstood. So um, I'm going to be taking a picture of the mantis and my drawing and posting it on, on Facebook. If you want, you can always just go to my Facebook page, at Insectopia2015, and you can post... You can post your picture right underneath mine, and we can have, like, a whole collection of all of the drawings of jeweled flower mantids, and that would be so 
cute. Um, I love viceroys. Viceroys don't get enough love because everyone's paying attention to the monarchs. True. Can I tell you one fun fact about viceroys before I go? All right, give me a minute. I'm using too much energy. <laughs> I was telling one of my friends recently that like when I get talking about bugs, even when I'm trying to like chill down a little bit and not use as much energy, I can't help it when it comes to my passions, and then I just overexert myself. I've got a vein popping in my forehead. <laughs> um, Viceroy butterflies have two or three different color morphs based on where they are in the country and the population of milkweed feeding butterflies that they are, that they are co-mimicking. Um, for instance, viceroys in Michigan and New York, like in the northern states where it's mostly monarchs, they're a really, really bright orange. But well, viceroys, when you go down to like Florida, Louisiana, and Alabama, the viceroys are like a deeper orange, like a dark orange, because they are co-mimicking not only the monarch, but also the queen butterfly. And because the queen is a little bit darker than the monarch, the viceroy there is darker too. They're like kind of subspecies, but they are all the same species. They can all interbreed. They're just different color forms, depending on what region of the United States you're in. And the other fact I learned about viceroys today when I was doing some research for this class is that the only, that viceroys are found in all of the contiguous 48 United, the 48 states, except California. I don't know what's happening over there in California, but I read something that said that they are extirpated from California. So they can be found in all of the states surrounding, but not in, and I'm curious as to what happened and why. Um, so I'm going to be doing more reading on that to see if I can figure it out. They're feisty and territorial. One year I got menaced by the same vice, right? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I, um, I was kind of describing them in relation to birds recently. Um, because monarchs, I imagine, they kind of fly more like eagles. They fly a little bit higher than all the other butterflies when they're just, like, flying for distance. Not when they're obviously feeding, they're low for the flowers. But when they're flying, they fly a lot higher than a lot of the other butterflies, but also they glide. So they'll flap, flap, and then glide some. They almost look regal, monarch butterflies, while they're flying. Whereas viceroys are, like the chickadee of the butterfly world. They like flap really aggressively and they flutter all over the place and they fly really low. And I don't know if they're aggressive or clumsy, <laughs> but they're one of those two things. Feisty and territorial could be also good words for them. Uh, I'm glad that my um, I'm glad that my really quick marker sketch was um, was recognizable. Um, I've also recently talked taught about orchid bees, and they're cute because the males have these crazy hind tibias that don't collect pollen; they collect scents from orchid flowers. Oh man, I've been um, I've been having a good time. I've been sick, so I've been reading a lot in bed about bugs. <laughs> Oh, right. Um, so I will see you next week. I have not received any suggestions. Bicycling with, with butterflies. Bicycling. I haven't seen it. Uh, so I'm going to have to look it up. I'm going to tell you, if you are a bird person, this book has been so much fun. Um, it's called, it's called the Birders, the Birders Bug Book. And, um, it has chapters like, well, the first chapter is all about, um, invertebrates, about insects, which is really cool. So it like deep dives into anatomy and all types of stuff. There's a whole chapter on bugs that birds eat, and then there's a chapter on bugs, so there's bugs that birds eat, and then bugs that eat birds. 
and then um, bugs that eat people, and then people fight back. So, like, the chapters in here are kind of fun. Um, and it's written for, like, the average naturalist. It's not written for an entomologist, so the terminology is not, like, really, really high up there. You don't need a dictionary to read it, um, so that's great. Um, a sting in the tail, a buzz in the meadow, Diptera! Sounds good. I'll put Diptera down. I'll grab us a really cool fly that we haven't looked at before. You're right, we haven't drawn a fly in a while. Um... And maybe, and maybe when we do a fly next week, I will share with you the coolest uh, fly anatomy thing. It was created by Cornell. I don't know what they call it. Um, it's like an interactive fly map. Um, it's kind of fun. Okay. Um... Have I done a mayfly or a helgramites? I have done a Dobson fly, but I have not done a helgramite yet. I'm back in Michigan, so now I can collect aquatics again. When I was in Pennsylvania, I was having such a hard time finding good places, like good healthy water sources, that I was not finding cool aquatic insects, and I tried many times. Um, there's this book that, uh, now I'm going to have to come back and read all of your book suggestions. I will admit, um... I, um, have not made it through Ant Hill yet. I am still, I have my, I'm about, I'm not a really fast reader, and then I get distracted. Um, but I have been very much enjoying Ant Hill, so thank you very much. Um, hey, I'm in Michigan. Very, very good. I travel all over the state. Um. I went to Michigan State. That's where my degree is from. Where my degree is from. Um, then there is this book. It's called Insect Lives. These are books that I've recently suggested to people, which is why they were right here next to me. Um, and it's like a. This is like the bug version of chicken soup for the soul. All right. There are little inserts written by all different entomologists. So, like, Maria Sybil Marion has one. I didn't read this one yet. Maria Sybil Marion is, like, my favorite insect illustrator, um, so I'm really excited to read whatever she wrote in here. Um, but they also have some pieces of, like, um, who else wrote in here that you would know? Um, E.O. Wilson has some writing in here. Um, I believe, um, they have some scripts from, from Darwin's journals in here. Um, what's the, the girl who studies the bees? They, at, they, wait She wanted, like, a Nobel Prize for her, her research in insects, and I just, love when may may Berenbaum. she has writing in here too um and so it's uh it's a cool book let's see if a hugger mite comes in my house shall i send him to you i mean helger mites are um Helgramites are the aquatic version, are the immature, so the naiad of the Dobson fly. Um, so you shouldn't have a Helgramite just crawling into your house. Uh, but if they do, yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I have drawn a Dobson fly before. It's been a minute. Um, we can do another Dobson fly at some point. I should get a video to send you the Bookshare Joy list. Oh... What is the name of this one? It's called Insect Lives, and it's um, edited by Eric Hoyt and Ted Schultz. Um, stories of mystery and romance from a hidden world. And um, the chapters are divided into, like, wonders of creation, plagues of vermin, to conquer the earth, insects take over. 
<laughs> I love it. Um, mass movement, social insects, insect architecture, lives under the microscope, mimicry, metamorphosis. So cool. All right. Um, thank you so much, all of you out there who hang out with me and chat bugs with me once a week. Um, I'm sure I thank you regularly, but it seriously makes a difference in my life. I look forward to live streaming, all right? It's not like, oh, darn, I have to live stream again. It's like, I can't wait to talk to my people and, um, get to draw with you and get to, like, get stoked over crazy bug things and find, um, did we ever figure out what Creo Broder I'm going to look up the, the root for Creo Broder, because we never looked that up, did we? brother, and I don't think that Google is understanding me correcting, and um, creo means give birth to, or to create. I'm not sure where they got the name creo broder. Do Helgramites have enough solid parts to be pinned? I know you've said some larvae don't hold up well. No, they do not. Um... Helgramites cannot be pinned, but Helgramites can be kept in alcohol. And admittedly, I don't have a large alcohol collection right now, but I can. Um, and once I do, um, specimens in alcohol can be drawn. It's just a little bit trickier. Um, so it might be something that we can look into, into soon. Your pup gets them? That's so cute. I love it. Do you possibly have a diversity about a video about the diversity of bug life, or could that be a topic at some point, like the phylogenetic tree of the insects? We can totally do a, uh, a phylogeny tree at some point. That would be a whole lot of fun. Um, I've been thinking about that recently, like doing specialty lives. Um, I wouldn't use my Thursday night lives for a special live like that because um, I like at least drawing once a week, but I'm, there's a possibility that I can add something like that. Um, flesh eating makes more sense than birthing brothers. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, Alright, so... Um, I do have a video that will introduce you to the five or six main orders of insects. Um, it's this one right here. Let's see, copy link address. Post. Alright, so that video, um, uh, so that video right there is a, um, is the top, the, the five major orders of insects, but it doesn't go into the phylogeny. It just goes over kind of what they are and why they're named that way. Um, but we definitely can do, maybe I'll write these down while we're talking about them. Where is my pencil? Oh, come on. I never found my ruler. My pencil is gone. Both of the pencils. There's one pencil. All right. So I was writing down. Phylogeny. And you would 
like uh, Statistics of Aquatic Insects Part 2. I probably could do that. Um, we got to discuss, previously we discussed The, we, we went over the groups and we talked minimally about the, um, the, some of the ratios, but we didn't go over all of them and we could do, um, aquatic insect stats is a fun class. I could probably, I could definitely teach that. I know I have promised you a wing venation class. And I started deep diving into wing venation, and I did not successfully feel comfortable enough to teach it. So I am personally still learning the naming of wing venations. And once I've got, once I figure out this system, I will share it with you. Um, wing venations. In the spring, though, now that I'm back in Michigan and I have um, access to Michigan State and I know all the people there, um, I can get CAD again so I can collect caterpillars. And we could do caterpillar diagrams. Oh! So, um, caterpillars, you identify caterpillars based on their hair patterns. And oh, I'm going to show you. I'll be right back. No, they're clear. <laughs> These are magic books that just disappear the moment you look at them. No, they're green. Um, but these are the um, Immature Insects books by Fred Stair. Um, he was at the MSU Museum when I was, and both of these are signed. I love that about these books. I get my, um, I get my books signed by all the entomologists that I know. But um, these books are no longer in print because Fred Stair refuses to digitize them. These books are so old, there is not digital versions of them, so the publisher stopped printing them. All right? Um, they're probably one of, like, my most prized books um, because they're really hard to find, especially in hardback. Um, you can find them in hard and softback, but... Um, the reason I went to grab them is because caterpillars are crazy, um, or maybe the people who study caterpillars are a little wild. So, um, those are hair diagrams. So each rectangle is a segment of the abdomen of a caterpillar. And all of the hairs are la are labeled and numbered. All right. So anytime you look at a caterpillar and you see all of the hairs on it, just know that there is an entomologist out there that has counted, labeled, and numbered each one of those hairs or hair clusters. Because if it comes out of one socket, they consider it kind of like one hair. Um, hard to find because they're <laughs> invisible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> I can disappear behind them. No, it's just because of the magic of green screens. Um, and admittedly, these are like, these books are, the last time I checked, were somewhere between $350 and $400 a piece. Um, so they're not easy to come by. Let's see. So... Caterpillars would be super fun to discuss. I just need to wait until the spring when there are caterpillars around so that I can collect some and then we can identify them together. Um, the caterpillar lab would be so cool. I have like all of their cards. The Caterpillar Lab has these, like, Caterpillar trading cards, and I think I might be a couple years behind now, but there was definitely one Christmas where I received the entire set, all of the Caterpillars, um, that they had, and it was super cool. Um, 
They have open houses. I did not know that they have open houses. Gonna have to do that. The other class I've thought about adding on to this, um, like side class, not a not a drawing class, would be um, <clears throat> we 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 talked about the stats on aquatic insects, but the the it's not really statistics, but the math behind um, the math behind degree days is a really, really interesting, um, is a really interesting equation and system, and I could teach degree days all day long. Um, and degree days are how, um, forensic entomologists, uh, determine approximate, um, time of death. Uh, they use they use this degree day equation. So we could talk about forensic entomology and then dive into um, mad um, maggot uh, life tables. That would be fun. Hopefully, my friend Kim will join us sometime soon. Ooh! <clears throat> Aw, that's so cool. Give me the math of degree days. Yeah, we can do that. Um, the degree day math is fun. It's less statistics. Actually, degree day math is more calculus um, than statistics. So it's a little bit, the equation is algebraic, but the understanding of the, um, but the understanding behind the math is, uh, it's, it's rooted in calculus. Um, but they pre-do all the calculus for you, so all you have to do are follow the algebraic equations. Um, kind of like when they turn physics into algebra, because physics is meant to be calculus. <laughs> um, okay, so degree days, caterpillars, phylogeny, aquatic insect statistics, and wing venation. All side fun stories. Maybe what I'll do is I could actually schedule those out. Um, so YouTube does allow me to schedule future live streams. Um, and then you could kind of, um, there's a button that you can click to be like notified um, that I went live with it. Like a remind, remind me button. Um, so maybe I will go ahead and schedule them out. Maybe what we could do is just once a month. Let me push a little bit. <laughs> of course physics is meant to be calculus. Yeah, I got really mad when my physics class turned everything into algebra and gave us like a million equations when it all could have been solved by one calculus equation. No. All right. Um, and I'm sure that there are other kind of side topics that'll come along, but this is a really good bonus conversation post illustration. Um, and I love that you all are still hanging out with me. Um, I personally don't read as much as I want to. I've been realizing that now that I'm like reading a little bit in bed, like while I was sick, I I kind of miss reading about bugs a little bit. I hadn't done it in a while. And so, um, there's a part of me that wants to start, like, an insect article club or something where I, I send out a PDF of some interesting bug or some new science that's come out, and then we all read it and join and talk about it. We all stay up. composting insects. So how many of you who are still hanging out would be interested in receiving like a true primary research articles about insects and chatting with me about them? They would be they would be written at a really really high level but after we like after I sent them out I would probably read it multiple times so that I knew I was understanding it and um, then we could come together and we could ask questions and discuss and chat and stuff. Is that something that you would be interested in? Okay, there is interest. All right.
you know what I'll do is I'm gonna see about I'm gonna see about looking up some articles and look at my schedule and pick a day. Uh, keep your eye on my Facebook page on my Insectopia Facebook page because um, I think that that's where I'll put the PDFs. I'll just I think that Facebook allows you to upload external documents. I'll see. Um, if I can't post the actual PDFs of the articles, maybe I'll be able to find links that you can go to the PDF virtually, depending on what I find. Um, I was actually just reading a scientific article today on the history of insects and gynandromorphy. Um, so gynandromorphs is, are something that I find really fascinating. Oh, I was reading one about ants and gynandromorphic um, ants where their heads are all wacky. Um, super cool. Yeah, and so that's what I wonder about, like, all of that. And um, I'm going to have to look into it because I bet you that 90% of the actual people who have written the research, they, they want their research to be read and to be discussed and to be, like, interacted with. Um, so if it's a link that is widely open um, on the Internet, then I don't think there's a problem. But if I have to go behind a paywall to pick to get the PDF, then I think what I will end up doing is emailing the people who have written the article in advance. Which could also be kind of cool because if they know we're going to talk about their research, maybe they'd show up. A lot of authors put their papers on their own websites. Yeah. Google Scholar. Google Scholar is what I generally use. Exactly! How cool would it be if the actual uh, people who wrote the articles would want to join and chat with us? Um, so, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We have to pick a first article. Um, admittedly, I'm thinking it's going to... I might just choose that ant article because I know that it's not behind a paywall and it was readily available for me and I want to read it and understand it more thoroughly. And this will give me a reason to do that. Um, cool. Because I find that when I spend so much time of, my, of mine teaching, and I love teaching, but I tend to neglect continuing my own personal learning Pro learning when I am spending all of my time teaching. Okay, so um, it's almost midnight. We've been doing this for about two hours. Um, I will be taking a picture of my drawing, which now has a bunch of other notes next to it. I've been writing on my drawing, so um, I don't know. Well, I, may, I might just post it the way that it is. Say, hey, this is what nature journaling looks like sometimes. Sometimes you just get distracted and you create all of the side notes. It's all insect related. Okay, um, so I'm going to create this post, and then I will go ahead and post the, uh, the link to the um, ant uh, gynandromorph article. Um, how about Monday nights? Do you all have Monday nights available? I'm gonna have to pick a day. Okay, I don't kind of. I kind of don't want it to be random. I want you also to be able to join. Um, my weekends are very full with like. My weekends are full with uh, traveling a lot of times, um, but by Monday night, generally, I'm home. Um. Oh, I know. I'm going to make a, um, I'll make a poll on Facebook. All right, so I'm going to post the link and the poll for what day uh, is, is best for you um, to discuss. All right, I hope that you all have a fabulous rest of your week. I hope that um, you post, uh, you post some um, 
fun pictures of your drawings and the art that you have created, or just join us over for the chatter and uh, like some of other people's posts too. Let's go and support each other in our in our art that's being created. I hope that everybody has a fabulous rest of your week, and stay buggy. Looks like my.